Well, we're down to uh, waxing the chair. So uh, the oil has has dried. Uh, I, I put three coats on it, and uh, so I've waited a couple of days for the oil to dry. And now <clears throat> those penetrating molds, a lot of times, especially on oak, uh, they don't dry evenly. They'll, there might be little shiny spots, and uh, uh, so I like to even even all that out. Uh, before I wax. And you know, I mean right now if you look at your chair and you like the way it looks, then fine, you don't need to don't need to wax it. Just skip the skip the step. But uh, uh, a lot of time and, and I'm not sure what the I mean the wax might give it a tad bit of protection, but it makes it all nice and shiny and silky for when the customer picks it up. So uh, it's kind of a showy thing to do. Uh, so I take some four alt uh, four alt steel wool and uh, I, I just lightly just rub it just to even out even out that finish it will it will lightly dull it <clears throat> and you know if you see any spot that's really shiny like sometimes a little bit of oil got got caught up in in uh, one of these little uh, V grooves right here and then I didn't catch it and I didn't get it wiped off and so the back side of that bird's beak might be uh, have a little shiny spot on it so you want to watch out want to watch out for that uh, let's see I didn't finish with this one over here did I gives you, this is a good time to really look at everything close. Not that you can do anything about a problem, but maybe it, make note of it for the next chair. Uh, <clears throat> the seat looks Looks good. I don't hardly see anything there that needs to be, needs to be rubbed. Rubbed on. Like I say, it's mostly mostly the oak. Although that arm rail looks good on this, uh, especially in the radial plane right here, you'll get bleed bleed back. Uh, and that oil, you'll wipe it all the way off, and then an hour later you'll see a little, a little dot there where the oil is bled back through. And if you keep that wiped off consistently, then you won't have a little shiny spot. But I noticed that uh, I noticed there's some on the on the cone right up here. I think this is about the only place where there is some. Yeah, there's a bunch of them across through here because the cone's all radial plane back here. Here's 
my compressor to get the, <clears throat> just a joke, my steel wool off of there. Um, so now I'll put paste wax on there, and I, I'm not particular about what kind of paste wax that I use, but I do need a cloth. You don't want to put on too much wax, just enough, just a thin, thin coat is all. And I don't know if you can see on the camera there, how when the wax dries, it has that dull look to it, so you can see really if you've missed any spot, any spot that's remaining shiny, hasn't been covered yet. So just a little bit on the comb here. Well, I'll let that dry, and uh, <clears throat> I think maybe while I let it dry, I've gotten some comments from people that's been watching this, and they'd like, they're wanting to see the shop, they want to know the size of the shop, how the shop's laid out, so I thought that's what I'd show you, that's what I'd show you right now. Okay. So the shop is uh, 16 by 20, uh, it's a, a timber frame, I built it about, uh, oh, 1993, I think. And uh, it's just the right size uh, for me. It forces me to keep it, uh, keep it clean, as you usually see. Everything's all clean and put away. If something comes down from the house, like a lamp that needs fixing, it's got to be fixed and getting gotten back up there. There's no place for it to, to sit around. So I think there's this huge advantage to having uh, a, a, a small shop. I think everybody's got, you know, too big of a shop. And then you look and you see what's in it and stuff's piled up all over the place. So I, I like it small. Uh, so it's the kiln right here that you've seen uh, some, it's about, uh, I don't know, 30 by 40, something like that, uh, where I can put my back in it. Runs off of three uh, uh, 100 watt light bulbs, I like to run about 150 degrees. Um, you see a lot of the <clears throat> bending forms up here, 
uh, some straps that I use if I have some wood that either won't bend well or if I need extra leverage on it, but I rarely, rarely use a strap to, to bend with. Uh, I'm my famous storage sink here. This sink, I have delusions that one day I'll actually have water coming out of the thing, but right now it handles all extra parts. And uh, so the door coming in. This is a, a paint cabinet here, finishing cabinet. Um, okay, so we move over to the next corner and it, the, the most organized part of my shop are my, are, are my hand tools and uh, uh, so everything has a, has a place here and I like to keep them up there. If they're just about not in use in my hand, they're up here. I, I, I don't like for my workbench to get covered with, with, with tools. Um, and then a few books up here. The, this is a, a cabinet with accessory stuff, glues and all kinds of stuff and it gets it gets turned into a mess uh, and about every six months I go in there and straighten it up and, and clean it out. But you can see what I'm kind of a mess. I mean it's semi-organized but, but it gets piled up because it's where something gets stuck that doesn't have any other type of place like uh, the sheet that I might cover a, a chair with to keep the dust off of it. So uh, uh, anyway, and then I close the door so I don't I don't have to look at it. Well, this is supposed to be just for my sharpening stones, but since it's a flat area and it's right behind my bench, it, it gets other stuff put on it. But I'm always trying to get it off of there and get it off of there and keep it clean for my for my sharpening. You know, it's just real important if you use hand tools that your uh, sharpening area is easy. Your stones are always there. You know, I just pick that up. Right there is my 8,000 grit water stone. It's ready, it's ready to go. You have to make sharpening easy in order to keep your tools sharp all the, uh, all the time. Uh, oh, a few things hanging around up here and a few little memorabilia things that find its way on the, <clears throat> on the wall. The, one of the only two uh, power tools that's in the shop and uh, this is a, a Yates American lathe I think from the, from, from the 40s that I uh, ran across about 20 years ago I guess and uh, uh, so uh, turn on the uh, mm, turning patterns I like the the light as you notice I have a whole lot of windows in the shop uh, so I like a lot of natural light and with turning it's really nice to have these two windows right here and then I can look up and I see across the park or whatever too then my the way I heat the shop and I like to burn it most of the time with the doors open and the screen in front because I work down here by myself and it's sort of like I got a little friend with me all the time. The fire's alive and going and gives me something to kind of look over at and throw a little bit more wood on and stand beside. Like right now, it's a little cold outside and it feels nice just to stand up, stand up next to it. It also burns a lot cleaner like that, have less creosote buildup. Uh, <clears throat> So over here, as you see, there's a few things that have found their way over here, a couple of unfinished chairs, but this is my uh, grinding area. I keep that away from my, from my sharpening stones. And uh, so uh, it's also a little bit of space for when I have a student, they come in and yeah, put their stuff on, the, uh, on a bench. And, uh, <clears throat> Then I've got well, I've got a few lights that I've hung up over the grinding, over the grinders, uh, and then of course as you can see more bending forms hanging around. I've got I've got bending forms. I don't even know what chairs they go to. There's bending forms under the shop. There's bending forms in the garage. Uh, I guess one day maybe I'll go through them. One day I won't. <clears throat> So here's where my seat carving bench stays when I'm not using it. It's got, you know, about 150 pounds of sand in it, but the floor is slick, so it enables me to slide it out to use it and slide it back, even though it won't move when, I, when I'm working on it. So it's got a nice home right here out of the way uh, where I hang my coat and my broom and my hold fast and some et cetera stuff. So over here's the little bandsaw. It's a 14-inch delta from the, from the 70s. So it's a good saw. As you've probably seen when I was working on the shaving horse outside, I've got a, a 30 inch uh, C-frame saw from back in the, the teens, I guess it was, and we'll walk out there and, and, and look at it. But, uh, uh, and then 
I've got my lofts. I've got uh, two lofts on either side or a loft on either side, and it's where my seat material is is stored. I have a broken step ladder that I use to get up there. Just have it on a hook. I lower it down. <clears throat> no. And then I got some old chairs sitting up there. That chair right here is uh, the first, well, the second rocker I ever made. I made it for my wife when she was pregnant with her second daughter. It's not very comfortable, so I brought it down here. And then over here on on this side is a little high chair that my kids grew up in. Uh, the reason it's hanging up there is I ran over it with the truck one day. I didn't know it was in front of the truck and broke it to pieces so it just hangs there. And then beside it is a chair from the uh, uh, late 1700s probably. And a fella stood on it to change a light bulb and broke the undercarriage to pieces and brought it here. Wanted to know if I would fix it, but it's too broken up for me to fix. And he never came back and got it. So then, okay, so you've seen the inside of the shop. I thought now, you hear all these sounds during these videos of the train and the courthouse clock dinging, the neighbors coming and going, and my wife coming over the intercom. So I thought I'd show you outside and so you could see, you could connect with where these sounds come from. So let's walk outside. So this is where I, well, there's my courthouse clock dinging right now. So we'll go see it in a minute. Uh, this is where I bring the logs in, right here, and you can see there's some white oak and red oak that are all split up here. There's a little piece of sugar maple here for my legs that I that I hadn't split up yet. And uh, so I'll split it up. If I need to do some rough cutting, I cut them off on this big bandsaw that's right here underneath the underneath the shed. So if I need some uh, rough cutting on these parts, on these split parts, then I do it right here. Uh, outside on this on this large band saw uh, so uh, and then the like the walnut chairs and the cherry chairs that I that I do I can't split them as accurate as I can the oak so I'll split those logs down as small as I think I could split them and then I'll put them on the band saw and I'll I'll rip actually on the band saw okay so we're in front of the shop here you see we had a skiff of snow last night and it's melting off coming off my roof uh, those are the front porch that Right now it's full of firewood. Uh, hopefully I'll burn it all by summertime if it ever get real cold. And uh, then I'll have my porch back again. So you see the house up there uh, and my, my drive to work is down that pass, uh, about 150 feet. And as we come around, you'll see the, uh, the town out through there and the courthouse clock that you hear Ding, it shows it's 12 o'clock right now. Uh, so uh, you can see a view of our town. And then back here across the park, see the creek down the park, and that's the railroad tracks over there, and that's where the train, of course, has been coming through about six to eight times a day. Um, and uh, see my raspberry bushes that need cutting here. If anybody wants to come and cut them, they're fine welcome to cut them back. Uh, the wax is dry and now we just buff it and boy you can see it just bring up a nice low luster sheen. Uh, doesn't require a whole lot of a whole lot of buffing.
on for the last bit of buffing here. chair is 100% complete. Well, before I go away, since we're all finished, I want to show some people behind the scenes. So, the person standing next to me is the person that you hear coming over the intercom telling me lunch is ready. My nice wife, Marilyn. <laughs> and then i got to show you the guy who's responsible for all this, who is. Oh, no, exactly. But you all need to <laughs> thank the guy behind the camera, my neighbor and friend, Gary. <clears throat> and uh, been my pleasure. Oh, thank you. Thank you for doing it. And uh, so, doesn't mean we're finished filming. If uh, I, I don't know what I'll do next, but if any of y'all have suggestions, just write me and tell me. You know, maybe, I don't know, show you how to sharpen a draw knife, show you how to make a continuous arm chair. I don't know what we might do. So, anyway, thanks for tuning in, and maybe I'll see you next time. Bye.